Hood. So today we're going to talk about Nala Hopkinson's novel, Midnight Robber. Now, for my money, Hopkinson is one of the most interesting writers working today um, because she has a distinct approach to science fiction and fantasy, which is built out of Caribbean cultures, her, her own native Caribbean cultures. Um, and so that's, I mean, Midnight Robber is in that category as well. And then the other thing that she, she tends to lean toward, at least from the couple of her books that I've read, is uh, coming of age stories. So there's actually, to, to me, there's, there's a sort of really interesting uh, interconnection there between the coming of age story and a distinctive approach to science fiction and fantasy because um, I mean we tend to think of science fiction and fantasy as primarily at least in places like the US and the UK and in and, and Western Europe we tend to think of science fiction and fantasy as primarily peopled and led by white people with cultures largely uh, in standard English speaking um, and things like this. There are some exceptions, obviously, things like uh, Firefly and, and Serenity um, blend in elements of Chinese culture. Um, obviously, things like uh, Star Wars have, draw from samurai movies and things like this, as well as Westerns. But we tend to think of English as the primary dialect. We tend to think of uh, <clears throat> white people as the main actors, and in Hopkinson's book, we don't have that. We have um, a Caribbean Anglo patois as the the main language spoken, and we have characters who uh, are clearly uh, of Afro Caribbean descent. They're now on a, a different planet, um, so this is a, a, a futuristic planet in which, uh, where we start, sorry, on a futuristic planet um, in which there's a high-tech uh, system of sensors called the Nanny Web, um, named after the, the figure who uh, rescues people, the figure... The figure or the ship. It's not 100% clear because this is the sort of early mythology of this of this planet. Um, but these people have come from the Earth on a spaceship. And it seems like different spaceships from different geographic regions have gone to different planets and s established different colonies. The planet Toussaint is people by um, people of Caribbean descent. And so, um, the nanny web is this system of high-tech sensors and uh, complex AI uh, support system, I guess you'd say. Like, there's, uh, Tantan is the central character, so we'll, we'll, we'll just start with that. Tantan is a child, uh, the daughter of the mayor, of this of this particular county um, or this particular town uh, she has a nurse she has uh, what's called an issue which is a kind of butler slash computer slash reference guide slash companion um, the system keeps track of everybody, so it knows what everybody's doing, it monitors things like health, um, it monitors their activities and things like this, it monitors their conversations and things like this. So, in a way, this is this has a sort of dystopian potential, but actually it's presented as, as quite a useful, helpful thing for uh, keeping people interconnected, keeping people safe, giving people access to information, and so on and so on. Um, so this is the initial world that Tan Tan finds herself in. Um, when her father accidentally murders 
the guy who's sleeping with Tan Tan's mother, um, he he takes Tan Tan, her father Antonio takes Tan Tan, and they escape through uh, an interdimensional portal uh, to a world called New Halfway Tree, or a dimension. So it's an interdimensional portal, so it's a, a different version of the planet Toussaint without the technology. So basically they show up in this sort of space jungle, I guess you could say, uh, where they immediately uh, meet a character uh, named Chichibud, who is a Duan, which is uh, the name that these exiles have, the people who've been exiled from Toussaint to New Halfway Tree, uh, the name that they've given this species of indigenous people, the Duans. Uh, so Chichibud is a particular uh, Duan, and he leads them to a human settlement while, uh, at the same time, starting to teach them some of the skills they're going to need to survive in this on this new planet, which doesn't have the nanny web, so it doesn't have that technology integrating them, protecting them, providing them with information, and performing the vast majority of the labor for them. So, for the first time in their lives, they have to do physical work. Now, Tan Tan's only about seven at this point, so she's not necessarily doing a massive amount of hard physical labor immediately. But Antonio, who is an adult, has a really difficult time with the transition to a world where A, he's not mayor, B, he has to do hard labor, and C, he doesn't have his wife with him. Uh, and that becomes really important because in a very short time, he basically starts raping his daughter because she reminds him of his wife. And this goes on for several years. And so this is one crucial aspect of, of Tan Tan's coming of age story is this internalized guilt that she feels because as is so often the case with rape and sexual assault, um, there's a big part of Tan Tan that blames herself as opposed to, and I mean, consciously she knows that this is Antonio's fault, but there's a big part of her, again, that, that blames herself. And so she, she develops this inner voice that she calls bad Tan Tan, uh, this this voice that constantly blames her, that tells her she's worthless and things like this. Um, so that happens for, for several years until uh, she gets a, a knife for her birthday uh, and she accidentally slash in self-defense kills Antonio as he's violently raping her. Now, I, for me as a reader at least, this seems like it should be justified as a, as a self-defense thing, but in this settlement that they live in, murder is absolutely prohibited. There's no, there's no such thing as extenuating circumstances. And so, uh, Chichibut, who finds her um, with the body of Antonio on top of her, uh, takes her out into the bush, out into the jungle, to live with the Duans, which is a big problem for the Duans because basically they are they're living under the the, the human radar. Uh, so humans know about them, and humans. Interestingly enough, humans use them as kind of field servants, not necessarily slaves, but there's something of that, like, you're a lower form of life and you're going to do labor for me and I'm not necessarily going to respect you, kind of, kind of attitude. Um, 
which is really interesting. I'm going to come back to that a little bit. But the Duans... So the humans don't know that the Duans have their own civilization out in the bush, and they have their own way of living in this complex society that is extremely low tech, but is very much integrated with nature. Basically, they live in a, a, a colony in a tree, and they grow herbs and things like this in uh, piece in, in, in little pits scooped out from uh, the tree branches. They uh, use the, the flowers and things like this to to generate drinking water for themselves and things like this. So it's very much integrated with nature. But nature also is threatening on this planet. There are a lot of, of creatures that can attack you, that can kill you very easily. And so in the seven months or so that she's with the Duans, Tam Tam learns all of these things. So she's about 16. Uh, is actually her 16th birthday uh, when she leaves uh, to go to go live with the Duans after accidentally slash in self-defense murdering her father. But uh, in that time between seven and nine, when she lived in this in this human civilization on New Halfway Tree, uh, she learned a lot of skills and she she developed an ability to uh, work very hard. When she goes to live with the Duans, she has to work a lot harder. She has to learn a bunch more skills to be able to survive in this wilderness and to, to live with the Duans, but also to forage for her own food. Because she never... So the Duans eat raw things. They eat raw tree frogs, they eat raw grubs and maggots and things like this and Tan Tan is never able to bring herself to do this however at one point so she also, she also finds out that she's pregnant with Antonio's child which she's not a big fan of and it's it's a sort of burden that she convinces herself initially that she wants to, to abort. She had aborted one of Antonio's babies before, but she, she can't, she has, she, it's very difficult for her to make her way into a human settlement. Um, so eventually she does that, but the problem is that she keeps going back in this persona of the robber queen, Tan Tan the robber queen, which is where the title Midnight Robber comes from. Um, it's a it's a it's a figure from Caribbean carnival celebrations, um, where basically this person dressed as a a bandit um, will tell an elaborate version of a, the the robber king's story, or in this case, the robber queen's story. Um, and if they if they can impress the crowd with their uh, storytelling and the the power of their language, people will give them money. Tan Tan adopts this persona because this is a persona she's always found fascinating, and she becomes this kind of Robin Hood figure. Um, so like, uh, she stops a, a mother from beating her son. Uh, she stops a um, a bartender from from selling his customers watered down drinks while pretending that they're full strength things like this so she gets she starts to get this reputation as someone who can show up out of nowhere uh, punish the wicked protect the the innocent but also as someone who's incredibly dangerous because she wields a machete the problem is that her stepmother, the woman who married Antonio when uh, they came to New Halfway Tree, Janisset. Janisset is pursuing her for murder. So 
uh, eventually she gets she gets these sort of progressively better and better cars because the they're blacksmiths in the town that that Tantan, Antonio, and Janicet had lived in, and they're building, they're working on building cars. So Janicet gets these progressively better cars as she progressively pursues Tantan. The problem is that at some point she finds the Duans tree in the woods. And so the Duans have to basically destroy their civil their civilization and disperse to live at other Duan settlements. So Tantan and Chichibud's daughter are basically sort of exiled from the Duans because they led humans to the, the, the settlement. Um, and so Tantan now falls into sort of the greatest period of priva privation in the novel, and this is fairly near the end. Um, but she eventually is at a carnival in one of these towns, a town that her, her childhood sort of sweetheart lives at, and Janicet catches up with her. And she has, Tantan has this fantastic moment, this lengthy improvised song that goes on for uh, five pages, basically, in which, in the persona of the robber queen, she tells the story of Antonio raping her. And she tells, and she and she indicts Janicet, who for years pursued her for the murder. Um, basically, she says, "You, Janicet, you bought me the knife to defend myself with. You knew what Antonio was doing to me, and you never stopped him." Um, and so she confronts Janicet with her with Janicet's own guilt, um, and this becomes a way of sort of purging herself, a way for Tan Tan to purge herself. Um, and she comes to terms, she's not happy with it, obviously, but she comes to terms with having killed her father. So that's the basic storyline of the novel. There's just a couple of things I want to touch on quickly that are thematically really interesting to me. One is um, the image of slaves and of slavery, um, because obviously uh, slavery is a big part of the heritage of Afro-Caribbean peoples. It's a big component of uh, Caribbean cultures. Is the history of slavery, the slave trade, things like this, and so. There are a number of references in here, even though this is hundreds of years, maybe thousands of years in the future, there are still references to the slave ships and the horrors of the slave trade, um, particularly in comparison to um, particularly in comparison to um, the trip from Earth to Toussaint. So that idea is really a, an important one. Um, and then there's another connection with between the, 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 the idea of the slave trade and uh, the interdimensional jump that Antonio and Tantan make because Tantan is terrified by these stories of slaves being crowded into ships and she gets that sort of horrific feeling during this interdimensional job. Um, the other thing that I think is really, really interesting, really, really important is the relationships between the humans and the Duan. Because again, the Duan are the indigenous people of this planet, New Halfway Tree. And 
they're much more attuned to nature, they're much more interconnected uh, with the environment and things like this. But humans use them as a source of labor, humans don't respect them as equal ethical beings, they're very clearly supposed to be subservient. And one of the things that the Dune are really concerned about is that the humans will eventually try and destroy their civilization. So actually at one point, Tintin um, and Chichibud's daughter, uh, or when they're when they're sort of when Tintin's first exploring, um, Chichibud's daughter kind of leads her to a forge that the Duan have constructed. Now the Duan are master weavers, they're master woodworkers, but they don't have uh, iron working technology, but the humans do. And so the Duan are trying to learn that. Um, and so Ch uh, Chichibud explains, yes, we're trying to teach ourselves, for tall people refuse to teach we. Um, And, and when Tantan -tan asks what they want to make, um, he says, guns, bombs, cars, airplanes, them is all words I learned from tall people. Tantan -tan says, I don't understand. And Chichibut says, is part of the reason why Abif Abitifea, that's his daughter, uh, come down here with you. She was supposed to keep you from learning this thing, not to lead you right to it. Stupid, defiant picnic. Tantan, if Duans don't learn tall people tricks, Una will use them upon me. So this is the this is the indigenous paradox in a way, is when a civilization with greater military or killing capability comes along, how do you respond? And one way of, of responding that indigenous peoples historically have tried is to utilize the weapons of uh, that colonizing civilization for self-defense, which is often unfortunately not that effective, but we get that sort of theme incorporated in. So we have these questions about, or we have these issues about slavery, about colonization and things like this, alongside these more personal ethical questions about guilt, um, about self-defense, about self-reliance and things like this. And so all of these things interconnect with large-scale thematic concerns and smaller-scale personal concerns.